today is Dr. Today about the idea of doing arithmetic without the concept of machine words, which is kind of a strange thing, but you know, let's just start out. So typically people talk about a machine word as being the basic unit of data in a computer. Uh, the official definition says 16 or 32 bits long. That's obviously a little bit of an old definition. Now we're used to think being 64 bits very commonly. But suffice to say, that's the way people tend to think of words. Then again, there's also the concept of a word being an exclamation used to express agreement. And basically, I don't agree, right? Uh, I don't think that the basic unit is a word. I think the basic unit of computation is a bit. So what I want to do is I want to try to use bit-level computation for all these things that we've been expressing, thinking of them as the word level, but essentially taking your, your math, taking your arithmetic, and actually doing it in the most efficient way possible only using as many bits as are necessary and as many gate operations as are necessary. So, we all have some stupid videos in here because I had to do something like that stuff, right? So, why should we care about this? Well, basically, I'm one of the people who started the cluster supercomputing revolution back in 1994. Built the world's first Linux PC cluster supercomputer. And I'm very proud of the things that we've done that way and what we've been able but to put it very bluntly, our, our goals were to make supercomputing cheap and to make supercomputers very scalable. But what's happened is things have gotten very, very cheap and more importantly, amazingly scalable so long as you have the budget. So, so how big have machines gotten? So here's one of the largest machines in the world today. And it's 8,700,000 cores. Right. Now, I know this seems like a really impressive thing, and it is. It's able to do all sorts of computations that people wouldn't have dreamt of doing even a relatively few years ago. But now start thinking about how much power that's consumed. So basically, you've probably all seen that my machine room is down the hall. Um, and uh, basically, my machine room down the hall here uh, I've got uh, a bunch of machines in 108A Marksbury. Actually, it's about 300 nodes of cluster supercomputer right now. Uh, the power and air conditioning in there, we actually have 100 kilo, 168 kilowatts, which is 72 20 amp circuits. Plus, we've got 30 tons of air conditioning in there. How many of you know what a ton of air conditioning is? Yeah, it's the amount of cooling that you get from melting one ton of ice per day. 30 tons of ice melted every day if I'm maxing out the air conditioning on my machine room. Right? 
Now, right now, we don't happen to have everything running in there, so we're not quite that bad. But suffice to say, that's a lot of cooling, right? And the power that's going in there is roughly what you would find for, say, about seven or eight houses of typical US housing. Uh, it's designed to cool and power 300 to 1,000 nodes. The waste heat is literally cooling, actually heating half of the Marksbury building during the winter. Don't really read it if you need it right now when it's 80 degrees out, but basically, yeah. This is a, a very huge amount of power, and now let me give you the shocking little summary. My machine room is not quite enough power and air conditioning to cool one rack out of a machine like the Frontier system that I just showed you. And that machine has thousands of racks. And that's not the only machine that's built at that scale. You know, when we first built supercomputers using PC hardware, we figured, great, we're going to make it possible for every lab to have a twenty dollars to $40,000 machine that can actually do real supercomputing on demand and can be dedicated to their applications. Great. But what's happened is instead, we have all of these systems now that are basically taking more power than the city of Lexington. And I'm not really comfortable with the fact that I'm sort of indirectly responsible for more greenhouse gases than everyone I know. So, got to do something to, to tone this down, get the power consumption back in hand. Now, there are a lot of people looking at ways to improve power consumption. Uh, certainly, it's a, it's a very in thing to be looking at for the past decade or so. Uh, for example, there's something called the Green 500 list, which is the, the 500 most green supercomputers, the most energy efficient ones. But suffice to say that most of the tricks that people play to save power are either performance throttling, which is not really the answer if you're getting less work done. Who cares that it's less power, right? Or they're doing things like, for example, adiabatic logic, which is a fairly exotic technique that allows you to get up to about, well, honestly, a factor of two or three power savings in theory. Two or three is not going to make up for the difference that we're talking about here. We need something that's going to give orders of magnitude better power performance for our computations. So back in 2017, I presented a kind of weird white paper at the Languages and Compilers for Parallel Computing Conference. And uh, basically, the, the main points of that paper were that now it's not really about how much parallelism can you find, how, how much speed up can you get. It's really about how much power are you using per unit of computation. Is there some way that we can reduce that? And at that time, I suggested three main things for reducing that. The first one was this concept that basically, you know, we can, we can essentially just use the active bits. So if you think about things like, for example, when, when you write a, a computation out, you say something like uh, int i for i equals uh, 0, i less than 100, plus plus i, blah, 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 blah. i is never going to get bigger than 7 bits. Does that make sense to everyone? Because 0 to 100, it fits in 7 bits. Why am I working on that with 32 or 64 bit registers? And with ALU operations that are actually actively performing gate level operations to compute bits that aren't actually involved in the computation. Okay. So that's the first idea. The second thing is to do very aggressive gate level optimization. Usually people think about doing fairly aggressive compiler optimization at the word level. And thankfully, this is a standard technology that's actually saving us quite a bit and has been for many years. The catch is that the things that you can see that you can optimize away at the bit level are a lot more than what you can optimize away at the word level. So I suggest we should be doing that. And of course, the last part is this idea that quantum computing basically works on the bit level. And it has this potential savings of being able to represent an exponential number of values in a linear number of bits, which basically means that if you play your cards right, every operation that you perform on a quantum computer could actually have a single gate level operation performing an exponential amount of computation. So exponential reduction in, in power consumption, potentially there. So these were the three things that, that I really focused on. And what happened with that? Well, fundamentally what we got was that, yes, people now realize that it's all about power per unit computation. Uh, working on active bits only, yes, we can do that. There are various tricks for that. Bit serial computation, which used to be done before people could afford to have wide ALUs, is actually pretty straightforward technology. We know how to do that. 
Uh, the gate level optimization, uh, we've developed a lot of compiler technology for that. It turns out it's not too bad. Quantum computing, well, basically, quantum computing is still kind of not really ready for prime time, but we did develop some SIMD parallel flow bit pattern computation model that kind of looks a lot like quantum. I've talked about that here before. So we've made a, a variety of strides, but fundamentally, if you're starting out with everything still being written in terms of word level arithmetic, all of this is kind of, you know, these first two things are really just sort of patches on that. What we'd really like is we'd really like the arithmetic operations to be analyzed and, and conceived directly from scratch as a bit level. So the key is really developing the concept of how you would do wordless arithmetic. How do you specify things without words? So how do we do it? Well, let's take a simple example. So here I have int a, b, c, c equals a plus b. You couldn't get much more straightforward than that, right? Well, this c equals a plus b, let's just look at the a plus b. If a and b are integers, basically, they're typically going to be 32-bit integers in, in most implementations of c these days. And what it comes down to is that's going to probably be built with a carry look-ahead 32-bit adder. It's a standard way to build a reasonably fast adder. And it's going to take about 645 gate actions to do that a plus b operation. And it'll give you about 12 gate delays. Now, the 12 gate delays, I'm not really too worried about. That's a good number. But I don't like spending 645 gates on, on doing this. So let's say that, for example, instead of doing a carry look-ahead adder, we just did a standard ripple carry adder. Do you folks all know the difference between carry look-ahead and ripple carry? All right, so carry propagation, when you're, when you're adding two numbers, is basically taking the carry from each bit position and, and carrying it into the next. And if you do that sequentially, you end up with a very simple circuit, but it's relatively slow. That's basically what ripple carry does. It's, it's just a, a chain of these one-bit adders. Uh, a carry look-ahead adder, instead, is basically computing the carries for the higher bit positions using a, a log time, but unfortunately exponential gate complexity uh, mechanism. So it's basically rearranging how you compute the carries so that you can get them computed faster, but at the, the expense of having a lot more circuitry. So this is what's normally done, but if I actually do this, I can actually get myself down to 153 gate actions for doing the same 32-bit adder. Now the problem is it's slower. 91 gate delays instead of 12, right? But if you think about it, if I had eight operations being done simultaneously, Basically, what I'm going to get is this thing here and this thing here are going to be at the same speed. I can get the same throughput, the same number of, of ads done per unit time. So if I use simply parallelism, which again, parallel processing is the way to get speed up anyway, we do that all the time. If I just use a little bit more parallelism, this can get me the same performance, but with lower power consumption. So is that as good as we can do? No, we can do much better. Only operate on the active bits. Well, if I take a look at this, let's say that it's four bit values for A and B, and I'm generating five bit result C, right? It turns out here's actually the gate logic for it. And I know that might be a little bit hard to read, but each, each of those is just a simple AND or XOR gate, things like that, right? And the, what it takes is basically your 32 bit ripple carry add, as I say, is about 153 gate actions. My four bit active ripple carry add is 17 gate actions. 17 is a lot less than 153. We're talking about an order of magnitude power reduction by just doing those gate level operations. And if I'm doing things at the bit level sequentially, I don't have to do gate operations that I don't have to do. I can actually pick whichever operations are significant, do those, and not do the others. Now, is this as good as we can get? No, we can still do better. It turns out, suppose that I know that B is equal to 1. So for example, if you think about it in my, my for, you know, int i, you know, I, for i equals 0, i less than 100, plus plus i, plus plus i is adding 1. It's a very common thing that people do. Well, 1 is a 1-bit number that you can just have as the carry input to your first stage of adder. And you don't actually have to have an adder. All that you need is an incrementer. It doesn't have a b input. Right? So what you end up with is, not only can I get it simplified down to 17 gates just by recognizing that, oh yeah, this is really only four bits, but it turns out that if I know that B is one, 
it actually ends up being just seven gates. So we've just gone down from 650 or so to seven gates. Now, I know that sounds like a pretty shocking amount, but basically we're talking two orders of magnitude savings here. Now, is two orders of magnitude as good as you can expect it to do? It turns out the answer is no. So let me show you a really bizarre case. I'm not saying this is typical, but this is a real example. So let's say that here I have these declared as 8-bit variables, A, B, and C, and I know that they're 8-bit. So this happens to be a syntax that I've been using for years in, in my mutilated C compilers and such. Uh, if you want to think of it this way, you know, in standard C, you might do something you know, using you know, one of the you know, built-in types that explicitly is, is a, an, an 8U. So it's an 8-bit unsigned value. The key point is, this arithmetic here, at the word level analyzing this, every single operation is necessary. There's nothing that a compiler can see here that you could, you could go, oh, it's not necessary, I don't need to do it. That ends up being a total of 206,669 data uh, operations even taking into account that these are only 8 bits. But when you actually analyze this at the bit level, it turns out that whole thing is actually equivalent to 8 to 0. Now, I know this is, again, a very extreme case because I'm getting infinite speed up. I'm going from 206,000 to 0 gates. But suffice to say, how many of you saw that this was 8 to 0 looking at that code? Right? And again, neither would standard compiler analysis but by moving it down to the bit level, we can actually get that very easily. So, we're not going to get infinite speed up, uh, or, or I should say infinite reduction in gates, but we can get orders of magnitude. We'll have to see just how many orders of magnitude. So how do I minimize the number of bits? Well, it turns out this is not really a new concept. Believe it or not, uh, not only do we have things like uint uh, which is a way that you can specify how many bits you want in an integer. These basically you know, are, are a bunch of header files that are, are defined through a compiler that say, well, if you want an 8-bit thing, if you want a 16-bit thing, etc. Uh, the bad news is, by the way, they don't do things like, well, if you want a 5-bit thing, they don't, they don't have 5-bit things. They just have the, the normal convenient word size things, 8, 16, 32, 64. Right? Uh, so you can use those. You can use the compiler analysis to infer types, which actually arguably predates even things like this by decades. So back in 1964, there was this thing called the Clara May system. How many of you have ever heard of Clara or May? So the reason that I've heard of this, honestly, is because I had a compiler class with May. <laughs> Otherwise, they probably would never have heard of this. But it turns out that back in 1964, they built this system that would actually figure out from equations written in a two-dimensional format, kind of like the format them for display in LaTeX, exactly what the variables were and how many bits you needed on each of them. So they actually determined the types directly. So that compiler tech is literally dating back to the 1960s, at least for very crude, simple versions of it. Uh, you can also specify accuracy requirements rather than precision for floating point. And back about 15, 20 years ago, I and uh, then professor here, uh, Bill Dieter, actually had a bunch of publications on how you could do that. Uh, and, you know, it, it, it's kind of a strange thought, but, you know, why are you specifying singular double precision when what you really care about is how many digits are significant in the answers? You should be specifying the accuracy constraint, not the precision that's going in. On top of that, there are all sorts of techniques for packing representations into these larger words if you have a smaller representation use. Uh, this is the thing that's usually associated with the concept called sibling within a register, which is, again, something that I've been deeply involved in for years. Okay. So these are the techniques that have kind of been out there. And for minimizing gate level operations, there are a bunch of techniques that have been out there. First of all, how many of you have heard of bit slice hardware before? So it used to be that when you were building hardware, you couldn't really afford the circuit complexity to have all the bits operated on simultaneously. So if you want to do a 32-bit adder, you didn't typically build a 32-bit adder. You would do things like take 4-bit chunks and do 4-bit adders to, to build this up as a 32-bit adder to over multiple clock cycles you can run. So bit serial operations or, or smaller chunk sizes used to be the standard way that you would build all these things. And what happened was, is we got more circuitry available, we could put more stuff on chips, 
we started to say, well, gee, that's a pain to deal with. Let's just make bigger word sizes. Then we don't have to worry about this again. But the catch is, as we've been doing that, we've basically been throwing away power. Right? Because all those gates that we've thrown in, yeah, it didn't cost as much to put the gates there, but it costs us a lot of power to actually use them to have them turned on. If we take a look at supercomputers that were built decades ago, SIMD supercomputers, single instruction stream, multiple data streams, basically vector-like machines, you'll find that most of those actually were built as bit slice machines, bit serial. So you had, for example, the thinking machine CM1, CM2, you had 65,536 processing elements, but each one, the ALU was only one bit wide. It could only do one bit operation per clock cycle. So it was doing you know, a series of those operations to build up a 64-bit ad or a 32-bit ad. Okay. Now, the bad news on this is that when they were doing this stuff, even though they, they got good performance and so forth, they really weren't taking advantage of the fact that their hardware was a bit serial. So what they would do is they would have you write your programs and you would say things like, OK, I want this to be a 32-bit int. And then they would call a library that just did the 32-bit int ad they wouldn't actually look at how many bits were really being used. They would just always work on the full number of bits. So what we want to do is we want to move away from this concept of, of having words as the basic model and basically keep track of how many bits are actually active and only work on those. So, so no more words, right? So how do we do wordless integer and floating point arithmetic? And this is kind of a weird concept because basically nobody's ever really talked about the idea of having variable precision integers at in floating point. So let me just say before I go any further, there's this little disclaimer down here, right? It turns out that I am actually going to be suffering some bookkeeping overhead to keep track of how many bits are valid. So if I were to do this for simple scalar variables, it doesn't pay off. So bookkeeping overhead would basically cost me more, more power, more circuitry than I would actually be gaining by saving those operations. However, if I have something that's massively parallel, SIMD execution, the cost doesn't get any higher for doing the bookkeeping, even though I can apply it to thousands of values being worked on in parallel. So I end up having a huge power savings, and basically the cost is amortized. So we're really only talking about this wordless integer and floating point arithmetic wordless floating point and integer variables for things that are parallel, parallel data structures. Right? Uh, dynamic optimization at the bit level. So remember I said we're going to be doing things that look like standard compiler analysis, but at the bit level, not at the word level. We're not just doing that at compile time. We're actually doing symbolic execution at runtime to save us actually having to ship all these bits around and even create bit storage. And the way that this has been temporarily implemented is just C++ classes. So you can actually write ordinary C++ code and have these variables that are basically undefined precision, variable precision integers and floating point values. So for dynamic precision, there are some languages that have static precision. For example, Verilog, you can actually specify exactly how many bits you want. You want an integer with five bits, no problem. Specify that. You want an integer with 207 bits, you can specify that too. The catch is you can't change how many bits there are at runtime. Right? And in general, if you take a look at, at other programming languages, even for example, C struct bit fields, yes, you can specify how many bits you want, but you can't have that variable at runtime. We need it to be variable at runtime. There have been a variety of big number libraries that have been out there. Uh, you know, big num, uh, GM, uh, you know, GMP, big digits, all, all of these different libraries. But they're actually not looking at trying to keep track of individual bits. They're trying to deal with having these very huge extended precision values where they're keeping track of how many words are being used in, in that. So similar concept, but a much larger level that doesn't really buy us anything on ordinary arithmetic. So we want dynamic precision at the bit level. And that's enough for everything. So, how are we going to do this? Well, let's think about dynamically resizing an int. And actually, we call these dynamically resizable things so p ints for pattern ints, but we'll, we'll come back to that idea a little bit later. So, if you have an integer that has the value 4, how many bits do you need to represent the value 4? Well, 
pretty obvious, right? It's basically no ones, no twos, and a four. So you need three bits for that. Now, let me point out that that's actually cheating a little bit already because I said it's an int. Ints are signed. If it's a signed int, it would actually need to have five bits because the sign is positive. So I would actually need to have a leading zero there. Right? Uh, the four bits because I need a leading zero there. Does that make sense to everyone? The catch is I can dynamically decide whether it's signed or unsigned. Right? Because signed or unsigned is not really a property of the variable. It's a property of the value that's in there at this time. Does that make sense to everyone? So with appropriate bookkeeping, I really do only need three bits for that. Let's say I want to decrement the value to three, right? Or, or from the, the you know, value well, to three there. Three is an unsigned two-bit integer. So now I go from having three bits to having two bits. Does that make sense to everyone? All right. If I take the two's complement to make the value negative three, right? The two's complement of x is not x plus one. That's the formal equation for it. For Two's complement. So negative three is assigned three bit integer, and it looks like that. And now, yes, that actually is the sign bit is here. And again, my bookkeeping keeps track of the fact that now it's a sign value, not unsigned. Does that make sense to everyone? So what you're seeing here is as I perform each individual operation, I can keep track of how many bits are active, and always use the minimum number of bits to represent everything. Now, with our pattern integers, what do we actually have for the bookkeeping? Well, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, so you have k-bit positions that are ordered, which is the way that we would think of a, a normal arrangement of things inside of a word. The catch is that k here is variable, right? And then you know, for each of those bit positions, basically we have an index value, and we call an index value. What is this talking about? Well, remember, you have these bit positions, but these are not single values. These are values that are in parallel across the whole machine. So for example, if this processor has the value 3 for this variable, and this processor has the value 2, then I need to have enough bits to represent either 3 or 2. Does that make sense to everyone? So it's going to be the maximum number of bits that I need to represent any of the current values across the parallel data structure. And so that's why we talk about index positions rather than bits, because it's really any of the values in that bit position on any of the processing elements that are logically there. So if we have nproc simply PEs, for example, on the old thinking machines box, nproc would be 65,536 processing elements, right? Then you can think of there basically being a data structure that looks like in each PE's memory, I have a particular bit offset. Uh, which is constant across the whole machine, and then I have basically I'm indexing each of the processing elements by the processing element number. So this is just looking at basically one bit position across all the processing elements in their local memories. Okay. Now, this is parallel, and if I have 65,000 here, I have 65,000 bits for each bit, right? But the bookkeeping stuff is not. The bookkeeping Bookkeeping stuff is just one copy. So what I have is I have a Boolean that says basically is the thing signed or not. And it's, it's signed or not based on whether it happens to hold a negative value or not. Right? If none of the values are negative, it isn't with signed. Uh, the precision is how many bits are actually active right now. And again, that can dynamically change over time. And then here what you have uh, is, is basically the, the array of bits which are, again, across all of uh, the, the uh, machine. So however many bits you, you needed, this is the maximum number of pointers that you could have to these things. And it's just saying, these are the set of index values that I use for getting at those bit positions. So make a long story short, this may look like a lot of overhead, but having one copy of this for 65,536 values makes this a trivial amount of overhead. Now, how do you manipulate the precision? Well, it gets a little tricky, but fundamentally, this stuff here, you can see, this is saying you know, that if I have uh, a bit position at the top bit position that I thought was active, that is basically the same uh, as the bit position you know, that I have next to that for all of the processing elements, then that bit is not needed. So for example, if you think about the value 4 in a 32-bit number, 
before it looks like 0, 0, 1, and then a whole bunch of zeros in front of that. Since the top bit is a 0 and the next bit is a 0, I can get rid of the top bit. Since the next bit is a 0 and the top bit is a 0, I can get rid of that. So you keep just stripping off bits so long as they're the same value across all of the processing elements. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. And then the other little check here is basically that I have at least one bit position. Right? So what I get is essentially, you know, this allows me to strip out the extra bits that are resulting from any individual operation uh, if they're not really meaningful. And so I'm just performing this little analysis on the values as a single pointer to parallel quantity rather than for each processing element. The functions that you have for playing with the precision explicitly, minimize, which basically says get rid of the extra bits that, that may have been there, uh, extend, which allows me to make the number of bits be whatever I want it to be. So for example, uh, if I have something that I want to do bitwise operations on with an 8-bit number, an 8-bit mask, I can explicitly extend things to an 8-bit value so that it makes sense to do a binary operation on those mass bits. And then no, promote basically is just a mechanism for saying, okay, whichever size these two objects are, make, make a, yeah, a new type which is the size of the result. So if I'm going to add a 3-bit thing and another 3-bit thing, for example, the, the result in general is going to be a 4-bit thing. So it would actually create that. So it would basically go things to four bits. All right, now how do we do this for, for floats? So we just talked about integers, right? For floating point, it's much, much more complex because you think about it, a floating point number basically looks like a pair of integers being handled in a really strange way, right? So you have a, a sine plus magnitude encoding of a mantissa, the fractional part, and then you have basically a, a two's complement plus a bias factor that's being used to represent uh, two's complement integer plus a bias factor that's being used to represent the exponent. So you've got these two fields, the exponent and the, and the mantissa, that are really just integers. So how do we handle this? Well, basically, to begin with, the sine, which is the sine of the mantissa, uh, basically that is just a single one-bit value. So we can treat that as just an ordinary integer. It's either, it's either zero or one. Zero if it's not negative. The exponent, basically, that power of 2 multiplier, if you think about it, and this is going to sound really strange, in 32-bit floating point, how many bits of exponent do you have? Anybody know it, man? Well, 32-bit floating point, you have one bit, which is the sine of the mantissa, then you have an 8-bit exponent, and then you have, basically, the remaining 23 bits are your, your mantissa, with a hidden one bit because it's basically, in normal form, you have a leading one on every mantissa. You know, every fraction starts with a one, right? So basically, this is normally eight bits. And uh, if you go to double precision, by the way, it's 11 bits. How many bits is it here? It's variable number of bits as needed. So it could be greater than or less than the number of bits you would have even for 64 bit. So basically, we don't have a bias being added to it. The bias in IEEE floating point is basically the, the negative of the, the minimum possible value. For example, the minimum value you can fit in the two's complement number for, uh, for the exponent for a 32-bit floating point number would be negative 128. So what they do is they add the negative of that, which would be 128 to it, so that the minimum exponent value as it's encoded looks like zero. Does that make sense to everyone? We don't need to do any of that garbage. Basically, what we're going to do is we're not going to have a concept of a maximum negative number that we would have to add in. So essentially, we don't have any bias or any reserved values. The exponent is just however many bits it takes to encode the exponent. Right. The mantissa is basically the fractional part, and we don't really need to have a fixed precision. We do have a fixed maximum, but essentially, we, we just encode that, and there's no reason to ever store the leading one, just like there's no reason to store it in, in traditional floating point. Normalized floating point numbers always have a one no, at, the, at the front. So let me show you well, what happens when we use this kind of strange representation. So well, when, you, when you do this kind of weird float, uh, what happens is the things that you normally don't represent as normal numbers in floating point, 
we have to still have a way of representing them. So what do they turn into? Well, first of all, zero can't be represented as a normal form floating point number because it doesn't have a leading one in the exponent, uh, excuse me, the mantissa. Does that make sense to everyone? Put another way, what power of two gives you zero, right? There's, there's no power of two that is, is zero when you multiply it by one, so you can't have a one in the mantissa, right? So that's done as a special case in, uh, in standard IEEE floating point. And for us, actually, it's sort of a special case, but it's really straightforward. If the sign is zero, meaning it's positive or zero, the exponent is zero and the mantissa is zero, we define that to mean that it's zero. Pretty straightforward. Okay. Not a number, which is used to keep track of errors or things that computationally made no sense uh, as a floating point result. You know, what, what is, uh, you know, five plus giraffe, right? It doesn't make any sense. Right? So not a number is the normal marker that's used for that. Again, not representable in normal form. We use that as basically something that's encoded kind of like a negative zero. Does that make sense to everyone? Infinities, it turns out you can have positive and negative infinity in IEEE floating point. And again, they're encoded actually kind of wasting an entire exponent value to be able to code that. We don't have to do anything that wasteful. You can see we just have the exponent is one, but we have a mantissa of zero, and basically the sign tells you whether it's positive or negative infinity. So we actually can very easily and cheaply support the same extensions that IEEE floating point has. And the interesting little thing is floating point in IEEE format, there's also all these denormals for handling things arbitrarily close to zero. We don't need to do that because we can basically grow a larger exponent so we can have smaller fractions if we need that. So our normalization rules are a little bit weird. How do you normalize a floating point number? Well, there, there are a variety of different ways you can think about doing it. Standard normalization is basically shifting things until you have a one in the most significant good position in the mantissa. Right? So your fraction should always look like basically 0.1 something, or for a thing that is one point something. Right? So well, that's one way that we can normalize. An alternative that we can normalize to is, is this. Basically, it doesn't really matter which of these we do. The key point is, we still have variable precision on the exponent and variable precision on the mantissa. And if we do this normalization, which is a little bit weirder, we actually get fewer bits than this, because we can usually throw out a lot of these mantissa bits. But suffice to say, either one of them still works really well. So this is basically what we're doing. We're, we're not actually specifying precision of anything at any point in time. We're just having the values get as big or as small as they need to be on the fly, which basically means, by the way, that if you're doing operations that, for example, wouldn't have given you accurate results in double precision, this will use more than double precision. It'll get you the accurate results. So what do we do at runtime? Well, at runtime, we have to be able to make this stuff work. So there's got to be some runtime support, right? And in particular, the runtime support is basically some compiler analysis to figure out when we don't really need to actually expand things out to these bit level op operations. Uh, for example, let me give you a stupid little example. Let's say I have one bit named A, and I have another bit that is zero that I'm going to add to it. And it's zero across the entire machine. What is A plus zero? A plus zero, or A or zero, if you want to think of it as a traditional single gate, right? Basically, I don't need to actually look at the bits. If I know that one of those things that I'm adding is all zeros, I don't need to actually break it down to looking at the bits at all. I can just go, oh, the result's A, and I don't change a darn thing. I don't do any gate level operations at all. Does this make sense to everyone? So any identities that I can recognize I can basically have the compiler just do the bookkeeping to get you the result, rather than actually doing the bit level operations. So that's what we're doing. We're working on these p-bit descriptors that I, I showed you the form of before. It's a single assignment form, so basically every time you have a unique new bit pattern created, it guarantees that it hasn't seen that before, so there's a unique ID associated with each of those. And that's how it can very quickly go, oh, this is the thing that's all zeros because it has the ID, which is the ID that we know is all zeros. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. 
So constant fold zeros and one. Now zero and one no, across the machine are zero and one descriptors, so we can trivially fold the things out so you don't have to do constant operations. And, the, and by the way, zero and one are the only two constants when you have bit level stuff, right? Uh, algebraic simplifications, if you have something like 42 and one, that, you know, pretty straightforward, right? Where keep in mind one here is an arbitrary set of points, not just one one. And then you know, common sub expressions, basically, you know, if you're doing something like C equals A plus B, D equals A plus B, you'd expect the compiler not to be stupid enough to do the add twice, right? Because A plus B, you know the answer is still the result you got before. That's what common sub-expression elimination is, and we do the same thing using something called duplicative caching at the low level. So this is basically almost directly implemented in the hardware. Okay, so what do we get? Well, this is going to be kind of a weird way of thinking about it, but in a classical SIMD supercomputer, let's say, for example, well, the mass part MP1 supercomputer that I had in my lab back in the early 90s. We had 16,384 processing elements. And if one of them wanted to do something, all 16,384 had to be along for the ride. That's the definition of SIMD, right? Single instruction stream, multiple data stream. You can disable the other processors that don't want to be there, but you still have to go through the actions for everybody, right? So traditional SIMD, basically, you can disable processors, but you're still going through having all of these things active all the time. If you take a look at GPUs, how many of you are familiar with warps and GPUs? Uh, nobody. Okay. <laughs> All right. So a GPU is a SIMD machine. The catch is, it's not a SIMD machine. It's a SIMD machine made of a bunch of little SIMD machines. So you have, uh, you know, in one GPU that has, let's say, 1,024 processing elements, what you might actually have is you might really have that it's, so, oh, let's say, yeah, uh, 256 four-way or something like that. It's not, it's not going to be one SIMD machine. It's a bunch of smaller SIMDs. So what happens is if one of those smaller SIMD machines happens to see that all of its processing elements would be disabled for a particular operation, it doesn't have to do that. So you get to skip warps of computation, warp being one of the little SIMD machines for versions of things if they're not active. So you can save yourself some overhead, you can save yourself some power, right? This is one of the big pluses for, for GPUs. Well, it turns out that if you think about it, not only do we get that advantage, but we can actually skip any chunk of computation where we've seen the same operands used for the same operation before on any set of processors, whether it's the same ones that are doing this now or not. So essentially, we get to remove redundancies at another level beyond what GPUs do, which kind of explains why we can actually have a lot higher power efficiency, because there's more stuff that we can basically recognize as redundant than not necessary. Keep in mind, this is for the computations that at the bit level look necessary. We're just saying, oh, well, if I can recognize what the result should be without actually touching the bits, don't even do that. Don't even touch the bits. Right? So this is in addition to all the savings that we were talking about before. So how does this chunk handling you know, work that, that we're doing to, to recognize that, oh, we don't really need to perform these bit level operations again? Well, let me just say, for example, if you had 32 processing elements, so you can think of each column here as being the data that's in one processing element, and uh, you want to represent the value of IPROC in each one, you can see here we've got the value 0 in processing element 0. Here's the value 1. Least significant bit is the first bit, and then the next the most significant bit, et cetera. You take a look at these bit patterns, and hopefully you'll notice, gee, these bit patterns don't have a lot of entropy, do they? This one is basically the exact same pattern that I see here, that I see here, that I see here, right? So if I actually give each of these chunks a unique ID, what you find is that this thing actually gets represented as chunk two, chunk two, chunk two, chunk two. And I don't need to have multiple bit copies of that. And if I see an operation, that was, for example, adding chunk one to chunk two, at most I'm going to do that operation once. And then I know what the result is in terms of whatever the chunk number resulting from chunk one plus chunk two was, that's what I substitute without actually looking at the bits for all the other chunk one plus chunk, chunk two operations. Does this kind of make sense? I know I'm doing this a little bit fast, but. 
So basically, this is the trick. So if you look at it, we had 160 bits to store that. But once we take advantage of this chunking, it's a total of 40 bits for this. And let me just say, as these things get larger, the savings also get larger. And then if I wanted to add you know, 1 to IPROC, I'm adding chunk 1 to all of these things. And again, you know, the number of actual operations that I'm going to do is adding chunk 1 to chunk 2 is just going to be one thing. I don't need to do that four times. Yes? Over here, you're saying like, uh, it saves the computation before like, like C. Like, where does it actually save it? Is it GPU or CPU? So there's no GPU or CPU. There's, there's this parallel bit pattern engine, which I'm, I'm going to show you some of the structure of the hardware. So think of it as it's, it's saved across the processing elements of this SIMI machine. Right? And, and so what it boils down to is wherever there's a bit pattern across the machine, it's always unique. And I, I, never, I never actually move the bits out of the machine. I only refer to the bits in, in that pattern by whatever the index number is that identifies where that's stored in all processing elements. Okay? So it's just the descriptors that I'm looking at. All right, so this seems a little bit complicated, as, as you're kind of pointing out. So how do we build it? So how do we put this dream into action? Okay. Well, basically, the initial implementation for this is a yeah, PVP library, uh, which has pint and pfloat classes. So you can basically treat pints and pfloats just like ordinary integers and floats. And by the way, whether they're signed or not is dynamically changing, so you don't need unsigned and signed PMs. Uh, the original implementation that I did was lazy C code for this. Uh, lazy meaning lazy evaluation, which is a good thing, but we'll get into the details of that. And it was about 3,600 lines of code. Right? So not, not too bad for the eager C++ evaluation version. Uh, P operations include all the usual C stuff and all the usual C++ stuff. And then actually some parallel operations, things like, for example, well, scatter and gather, reductions and scans. So how many of you know what a reduction is? In parallel processing, let's say that I have a whole bunch of values spread across so a bunch of processing elements. Very common, you want, might want to do something like find out, okay, everybody's got their own value for A. What is the sum of all of the A values across all the processors? So a reduction would be things like applying the plus operation between all of the elements of that to add that up to get one thing. So sum is otherwise known as an addition reduction operation, right? So these are operations working on parallel data to collapse a dimension over one, right? So it turns out not only do you get all the basic operations, but you actually get basic operations like reductions and scans, which are, are basic parallel processing optimizations, things that you use commonly in parallel processing. Float operations, not only do you get the usual ones, including things like reciprocal and transcendentals, um, but basically you've, you've got all the standard stuff you can see, plus again a few more that are parallel computing oriented. Uh, this actually runs on ordinary everyday 32 or 64 bit processors with up to 4 billion one bit processing elements hallucinated. So it, it looks like a 4 billion processing element system in the max. Now, that's all cool, but the big question is how much power are we saving? How, many, how much are we reducing the number of gates? Well, I've got a big fat library here that implements all sorts of different stuff. So the question is, I don't have a lot of applications written for this, but I have a library. How much do I actually reduce the computations in all the library functions when I just run the validation suite for the library versus doing the, the library computations the obvious way? So here are the answers. And basically what you're seeing here is if the number of processing elements that I'm pretending my, my, my SIMI machine has is 65,536, and I'm using 256-bit chunks, basically the number of uh, gate-level operations that it takes using word storage for these things is that kind of scary number to, to do the validation suite or the you know, libraries. It turns out that with our little tricks, that's the actual number of gate level operations that we've done. So I'm getting the exact same amount of work done between these two, but this many gate operations versus that. And you can see it's a, it's a 3,826 times reduction in 
and the number of gate level operations you need to perform. So even if your gates are taking the same amount of power, we're basically three orders of magnitude less power consumption. Uh, that's good. If you take a look at the numbers here, they get all the way up to this incredibly scary 188,000 for one. Right? So we're reducing the power consumption here by potentially up to 188,000 for one. And as a general comment, let me just remind you, this is doing the validation suite. The validation suite is basically checking each of these operations. It has very high entropy compared to normal programs. So you would expect that it would be finding less redundancy. And in fact, these are sort of worst case performance numbers. So what you can actually expect is on the order of about five orders of magnitude reduction, typically in the number of bit level operations you need to perform to do the exact same work that you had in your everyday program. In other words, better than words, right? So, the little detail that we have left is basically what hardware do you run this on? So, it used to be that there were machines like the thinking machine CM1, CM2, very pretty looking machine, by the way, right? Um, although the red lights meant they couldn't sell it in Europe because red lights mean that something's defective in Europe. <laughs> At any rate, uh, thinking machine CM1, CM2, they had 64,000 one bit processing elements in 8K groups. You can do bit serial operations on this be a perfectly viable target for this. They haven't been making these for many years, and nobody's about to do this. It's, it's, they're gone. And it's not just that machine. There were lots and lots of SIMI bit serial machines that were being made back in the, the 80s and 90s. They just haven't been in production for decades now. Another thing that we can target as wordless hardware would be quantum computers. Because quantum computers also are doing bit serial low programming. And the problem with that is they're stuck in five-way entangled, and I'm not going to go through the big details on that, but let me give you the quick picture. That means that they have a problem representing numbers that have more than five bits in them. That's not so cool, right? For example, my for i equals zero, i less than 100, uh, that's seven bits. That's beyond what you can do with current quantum computers, right? So basically, too few qubits, all sorts of problems. Really, the entanglement is the, the main restriction. And nobody really knows how to build much better ones. So here's one of uh, Google's machines. Here's one of IBM's. Suffice to say, they're really beautiful chandeliers, but right now they're not great as computing devices. Okay. So what can we do that we can run this on? Well, how about this little scary thing? So here I have a little ESP32. And I actually have this running a, a program using uh, this uh, technology. And in fact, this actually has the source code in here. It has a little uh, C++, uh, C++ subset compiler that does all this analysis and does the, the, you know, the arbitrary precision integer and floating point stuff. As I say, wordless math, the whole thing here. This is running a little demo program that's actually doing uh, semi-prime factorization. So it's doing semi -prime, the semi-prime factorization of 10-bit numbers on here. So I'll, I'll pass this around. You can actually see it running. <laughs> right. And uh, that is, by the way, not running at full speed. That is dramatically slowed down so that the display can actually show you what's going on. So is that the way that we really seriously intend to do this? No, but it makes a great demo, doesn't it? Because you can actually, you can actually implement something like this. And, and by the way, for the record, yes, this is running 10-way entangled computation. So this is basically orders of magnitude more powerful than any quantum computer right now, which is kind of scary. So it's the equivalent of, of 10-way entangled with 1,024 qubits on a $3 micro. Okay. Well, is that what we're really targeting? No. Basically, the reason we're not really targeting that is because, yeah, we can do this on conventional machines, but you know what? Conventional, conventional machines still have the ALU with all the stuff there, power on on most of this all the time, all the data paths are always active. Make a long story short, we don't really get the power savings from doing that. So, what we need is hardware that can actually give us the power savings. And that's what we're doing with these. So for the past two years, we've been working on doing a direct implementation in Verilog using an FPGA to do this. And any of you recognize these boards by any chance? So it turns out this board, which has roughly a $300 island part on it, uh, costs 
between $5 and $20. And the reason it's so cheap is because these were used as the front ends to Bitcoin miners. And so when China banned Bitcoin mining, these things got sold out in mass for five bucks a piece. So this basically is a way to get a nice big fat FPGA. The power consumption on this is such that you can run a pile of these off, for example, the USB output from, from one USB on a laptop. And uh, what we're actually trying to do is we're trying to build three different prototypes this way. One that will run on just one of these, another one that will be eight of these in a portable cluster that you can carry around and demo easily, and then the last one is actually going to be you know, a, you know, a cluster of at least 128 of these. We've already gotten the, the cards for 128, and if it works out well, we'll actually be building that up to 20, uh, 2,048 uh, of these nodes. And that is actually planned to be the next big machine in my machine room. And by the way, it's way under budget in terms of how much power and how much air conditioning it needs. Um, even though that's going to be a much faster machine than what we can fit in there by any conventional machines. Just to give you a rough number, we don't know how much we're really going to save, but it looks like we'll probably be coming in around three orders of magnitude power reduction for the same computations using this uh, with basically this weird custom supercomputer. So if you're interested in getting involved in that or, or anything like that, uh, you know, certainly this is, this is something that we're happy to have people involved in. Uh, so just to you know, kind of give the punchline, the initial results were basically saying four to six orders of magnitude reduction in the number of active gates per computation with no change to what the computations are at the high level. Uh, wordless so PVP, you know, the kernel bit pattern computing, has really great potential. It looks like, as I say, we'll probably be able to reduce power consumption, including all overheads, by at least about three orders of magnitude. But, you know, it looks like it's not the same as saying we have a prototype and we've measured it, right? So, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice, but I'm a very practical guy. I don't really believe that, right? So we have to actually build it in order to know that it's going to do it, but it looks really good so far. And as I said, if you're interested in working on things like this, uh, we, we plan to be doing a lot of work on this during the summer, and So that pretty much ends my, my presentation. So hopefully I didn't throw too much at you too fast, but there we go. Questions? We have time for a few questions. Any questions? Uh, can we use this technology to run things in GPUs? Like, have you tried to? So one of the first implementations that we made was actually trying to run this sort of thing in a GPU. And to put it very bluntly, yes, you can trivially run it in GPUs. The problem is, again, GPUs have way more hardware active than you really want. So we're not seeing the power reduction by doing that in a GPU. So yes, we, we can do that. We can get some speed up over running on a conventional machine. But it doesn't really do the thing that we want to do, which is prove that you can dramatically reduce the power consumption. By the way, I, sh I should mention using this sort of thing, uh, you know, doing doing 32-way uh, uh, entangled uh, thousands of qubit equivalent things and so forth on, on a laptop is absolutely feasible. So we've we've actually done some very scary things that way using really minimal hardware. So it's it's not like you need a GPU to actually do something significant. I mean, the thing you're holding in your hand is is actually disturbingly significant. Yes, we have a C and we have a C++ library interface that makes this fairly reasonable to use. But suffice to say, that's not really doing everything the, the, the ideal way. So we should be able to get still even better performance from it by making some tweaks to that. So there's some stuff that's basically cleaning up some C++ code. There's some stuff that is cleaning up the compiler analysis that's happening at runtime inside of that C++ code. And then there's a bunch of things that we're doing that are basically Verilog. Uh, programming to implement uh, the model inside of these FPGAs. And then there's even some interfacing stuff that's between the FPGAs and the hosts. And I didn't mention it, 
but in addition to the FPGA, the FPGA parts on here actually are dual core arms. So they're actually self-hosting. So they actually run a Linux environment on these boards. So interface the FPGA code to the Linux environment arms is, is something that also takes a little bit of programming. And in fact, that's the thing that's actually the latest the most. In theory, we might have been finished with this two years ago. If that didn't Come on by, and, you know, we, we can show you what, what we're doing and see what fits with your expertise. So if you want to get involved, there are all sorts of options. And uh, you know, during the summer, uh, it's very common that I'll be supporting on the order of you know, a half dozen students or so uh, for you know, undergraduate uh, REU type things or, or stuff like that. Um, if you're a grad student and you're interested in doing a project or if you're, you're interested uh, in maybe doing a master's thesis or a PhD thesis, those are also options. So there's all sorts of things that you can get involved in at whatever level. It's just a matter of you know, finding what's the best fit for you.